And, um, and see here Christ is on the cross and this is in a past when according to Paul is a mystery that God wants to reveal uh, him and also him seated at the throne of God uh, in his resurrection. So here we are in the future and uh, which is past this time. Now why I call it a mystery is because in this human history and in this timeline that we live, Jesus dying on the cross would be approximately uh, depending on when uh, you date the birth of Christ. Some people date from, it, it's not exactly 0 BC because our calendars are all messed up. So <clears throat> most people date some as far back as 6 BC but I tend to, uh, in teaching on the gospel, I tend to place it around 4 BC. We should place that the death of Christ at 33 years old will be roughly about around AD 29. Some people think that it's AD 27, plus and minus. Now in that area, we don't have to be dogmatic, but we just need to give a date. So in our timeline, it's approximately about um, uh, AD 27. It sounds strange. You know, today we got four letters for the year, you know, like in uh, the 2000 and something or 19 something. When they started, it was 180, 283 AD, and here 27, uh, 29 AD, sorry. 29 AD was roughly the timeline. We are now in 2018, way past. Some of us accepted Christ in the 20th century, uh, and that's still only about less than 100 years ago. But Jesus' uh, timeline from us to today would be approximately 2,000 years. And uh, 2,000 years, 2K. And that's uh, uh, interesting because we are not even born at that time. And of course the resurrection is only three days after, between that and uh, in three days. Jesus was ascended on high and here he continues to sit on the throne of God putting pressure on all things under all authority and rule comes under him. What is a mystery here? The mystery here is that how is it that we are born at whichever time here at point uh, X, whichever point we are born time here, you are supposed to identify with Christ here 2,000 years ago, uh, roughly 2,000 and identify with the resurrection. And there's so many scriptures on that. You pick any part of the gospel and it's there. Whether it be the book of Romans or any of the epistles of Paul. But just pick the book of Romans, that's for example. And uh, it might seem logical to us, but uh, to a non-Christian or to someone who's looking at this for the first time, uh, it's quite a big gap to accept what has happened. So in chapter 6, we are told that uh, in verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So there you go. We have to identify with an event that took place nearly 2,000 years ago. Isn't that a mystery? We're not even born at that time. So there's something about the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, uh, plus what we touched on last night, where everything revolved around the work of Jesus, the atonement of Jesus for us. In Colossians chapter 2, in what He has done for us, He has circumcised us, in verse 11, in Him you were also circumcised with circumcision made without hands, by by stripping off the body of the sins of death. See, something took place. By the circumcision of Christ, with our hands, something came into us. When it took place, in verse 12, we were buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith, uh, through, the, uh, through or by uh, the energizing of God who raised Him from the dead. I'm just mixing up with my own translation. And you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision in your flesh, he, he has made alive with him, having forgiven all trespasses. In verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which is contrary to us, 
He has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Again, there you see, 2,000 years ago, nailing it to the cross. Something happened. There's an identification that we needs, needs to take place. Uh, so there's this uh, mystery of the cross and the resurrection that we have to tackle here because it's like somewhere in the past. Now, we were also given an illustration by our Lord Jesus when he spoke about himself being lifted up in the Gospel of John. And, uh, in, and let's look at that account. It should be somewhere around chapter uh, 11 onwards. It's begin to talk about the resurrection and the life. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life, verse 25. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He says, do you believe this? And then they believe, of course. And uh, so Jesus continued to speak about that. Uh, and he's coming nearer and nearer to his resurrection. And as he comes nearer and nearer to the resurrection, he talks about, uh, uh, here's another place. He says, and uh, verse 24, 25, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And so he talks about how we got to deny this life. Then he says, and here's the part where he ties up with the bronze serpent. When the Lord answered with a voice, and he said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. See, Jesus doesn't need all these things. He knew what God called him to be and to do. He says, But he came just for your sake. And he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Now something tremendous was happening at the cross. That it defeated Satan. It's something that defeated sin. And everything was around the cross and the resurrection. And he ties himself to the serpent being lifted up. He says in verse 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what day he would die. So he talked about as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent, as he's lifted up. The people answered, we have heard from the Lord that Christ remains forever. See, they never understand all the scripture, the fine parts of scripture. They only know bits and pieces, just like today. Many people, you know, they argue with half an argument and half a sentence, rather than look at every scripture. And he says, we have heard from the Lord that Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So you see, they don't understand all those things. And uh, so he tried his best to speak to them, teach them, but they didn't understand what he meant. They have enough scripture to only believe part of it. But when Jesus was trying to tell them the whole plan, they could not see it, they could not understand it. So let's look at the uh, bronze serpent. Yes. And uh, with Jesus illustrated, the Son of Man will be lifted as the serpent was. Uh, and that should be in the book of Numbers. There is a story of the bronze serpent in chapter 21. It tells us here that uh, the background of this story is that they journey from Mount Hall by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. Because Edom don't let them pass through, so they could go one round. And so the people became very discouraged on the way. So you think that living this physical life day in, day out, day in, day, 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 in, day out does not cause discouragement? Look at them in the Old Testament. When they took the long way, they also got discouraged. But they should not, because they still got a pillar of cloud. See, discouragement only comes because of your own disappointment. And I always tell people, People put their own expectation on God or on the dreams or vision and misinterpret it. You misinterpret the dream or the vision and then you create an expectation. Then when the dream and vision doesn't come to pass you, and you get discouraged and then you blame God or you blame somebody. But actually blame yourself because you misinterpreted the whole thing. Uh, God is never wrong. God is always on time. Every vision and every dream, every word He speaks will always come to pass. And remember this. You must believe before you experience. That is a walk of faith. 
How long do you think Elijah prayed before the rain stopped? One day? Five minutes? Months? Years? How many of you think that he prayed a few months? Okay. How many of you think that he prayed a few years? Yes. So, what's there to be discussed when you pray for a few years for something the more powerful that changed the whole event of nations? Remember this. The greater the change you want to do, the more quality and quantity time you must spend. It's not like we are just changing the street down the place where you live. You're talking about changing the entire tide of the planet Earth with all the 200 to 300 over nations in the world. Even based on the simple law of signs and momentum, you know how much energy it takes to shift the whole Earth? Has any human invention ever shifted the whole Earth? None. You're talking about changing the whole tide of the earth. It is possible. In human history, inventions, discoveries have changed the world. But you know how they came. Through much vigor, discipline, persistence by the people who know what is true and what is true. In one moment of time, in the fullness of God, in the fullness of His time, we will change the tide of the world. But the preparation of the men and women involved must be so thorough that it is like forming the best steel plate and sword through the fiery furnace. Like preparing a sword to use as a weapon of war. Joseph changed the tide of Egypt and the known world in his time. You know his preparation started from the age of 17. He was 30 years when he stood in a position that God wanted him to, to change the entire world. Of course, he wished that it was two years earlier, because uh, much earlier. Uh, and, uh, so it is said that when he was in prison and he interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker, the baker died but the butler got released and the butler forgot about him for two years. Under Pharaoh had his dream. So here, as they were walking along the way that they had to go because God did not allow them to fight with Edom. Other places God, said, God lets them fight, but here God says don't fight with them. After all, they're related to you, so go one round. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Always like that, you know. Uh, I did not put that in the downloads, uh, but that was one of the things the Lord said to me. Maybe I should put it down. And the Lord said to me, when you have saved all the people through the Exodus together with all the leaders and everything, about 300 million people, some of them will be grateful, but many of them will be ungrateful. Would you still do it? And that was in a download that I just sent forth to some of you. I did not put that in, but um, then I said, yes, I would, because it is the right thing to do. You don't do something just because you will get people's appreciation and thankfulness. You do something because God called you to do. Whether people are grateful or ungrateful, you still do it. Because if you don't do it, they die. So you're not looking for gratefulness. You just want to save their life and then let them live their life. Then uh, later on, you know, in eternity, they might find out what you have done for them and become more grateful. That's fine. This world is this world. We live in the world of people who are ungrateful, who are unappreciative, unthankful, and is a part of this world. Take, people taking it for granted. 
But you still must do it because it is the right thing to do. And so I told the Lord, yes, I will still do it. The Lord smiled. So I said, good. And, um, so anyway, that is going to come to pass in its own time. But here, the people spoke against God and against Moses and said, why are you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? <laughs> they never died. Actually, they killed themselves by their own talk. For there is no food and no water. What? They have just got manna every morning and uh, quails at night. Uh, and uh, they got water whenever they pray, you know. Uh, and I'll so load this worthless prey. They complain about the manna. Can you imagine that? They complain every day eat manna. So again, these human beings are like that. Uh, and then the Lord sent, or allowed to be sent, fiery serpents among the people. That's how the fiery serpents came. They beat the people, and many of the people Israel died. So, it says in verse 7, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and then the Lord gave an interesting solution, because the law wants to do things that point to Jesus. He could have brought healing in different ways, but he chose this method. He says in verse 8, and this is the one that Jesus referred to when he said the Son of Man will be lifted up. Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. Now this is going to take time. People are dying here. And he says, he has to tell someone to forge. You know, working with bronze means you've got to use uh, met met metallurgy. So it's going to take time to forge the serpent, the carving. That's going to take probably, if they're very fast, one whole day, uh, if they work very fast, if not several days, before it's ready. And then people are dying. But what can you do? This is God's method. You can only obey. So it tells us that he did it. And uh, then you have to put it to, on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the serpent, at the bronze serpent, he lived. That's a, a powerful situation. Uh, later on, after many, many years, in 2 Kings, they had to destroy the bronze serpent in chapter 2 Kings 18 because... The people began to burn incense to it. How one generation for another is never, and they call it Nehushtan, the bronze thing. As if it's something to worship. It was not something to worship. It was something that will heal them in Numbers chapter 21. Now that's the same as they look at it. But what I saw in the vision is that some people who are beaten, when they look, for some reason, each person is individualized. When they look, they were immediately cured. Some people had to look several times. They had to look several times. And some of them looked and they thought they were cured and they went back. And then they discovered they don't fully cured, they came back and they looked. And some people, they had to look longer. But it was like, Individually, each was different. They had to somehow look at the serpent, and it was not something intellectual. It was something that bypassed their intellectual mind and went straight into their spirit. That when they see the bronze serpent, bronze representing the serpent has been judged, that there was a spiritual communication that is in a spiritual dimension, in a subconscious something click and they were cured what an amazing way right nobody went to suck out the blood the the poison from their bloodstream which is a normal way or find an antidote but just looking at a bronze serpent they were cured how amazing is that that shows a power of visualization 
when you visualize what God wants you to visualize. Remember the amazing thing about how when uh, Jacob uh, had the, had the striped, speckled, spotted animals, and he put it before the animals. And when they see it, they bear, even though they are pure white, they, they, they bore spotted, speckled, and striped. Just visualizing. Something was going on at the DNA level. Of course, because D has to be DNA level. It's the DNA that causes a, a sheep or a cattle that is pure brown or pure white to become speckled, spotted, and striped. DNA changes were activated when something linked up to their eyes, and not just their eyes, it must be the inner eye, that went into the DNA and command the DNA to shift and change, and it became striped, spotted, and speckled. The same here. These fiery serpents, according to tradition and research by people, are one of the most poisonous snakes in the wilderness. And in those days, they don't have the technology that we have today, where they can try to create antidote from the poison. The only cure in those days of snake bite was to suck out the blood, drain the blood, amputate, or whatever else. That's actually the only natural cures. So I would gather that if there was actual poison inside the bloodstream to the bite of the bronze serpent, something must be taking place at the subatomic level or the atomic level, when they were looking at the bronze serpent. All the poison that was already in their bloodstream after they were bitten had to be neutralized. So there has to be changes at the subatomic level. That just by looking, it changes them. So how many other times did we see in the Bible that by looking, things can change? Remember, Lord's wife, she looked back, turn your pillow or saw. Because there's something she cannot see, must not see. Must, don't know what she saw. That instantly changed her to pillow or saw. And we know that Abraham was told by God that he must see the stars as his children and the dust as his children. And he got younger and younger and younger and younger through the years. Visualization. In all the things of God, you must believe before you experience. Elijah believed for many years that he could pray for the rain to stop. So whether it takes a few months, a few years, doesn't matter. What God said will come to pass, I will believe it whether I experience it now or in the future. You must always believe first, then experience. That's the path of faith. Abraham believed God and he counted him for righteousness. He believed what God said. And God acted on the word many, many decades later. The power of believing. All things are possible to those who believe. But we can only believe what God tells us to believe. Because faith without God's word is not faith. It's just human conception. But whenever God speak, says something, speaks something, do not render the word of God of no effect through your own tradition. Because your tradition is a form of belief. You cast aside your tradition and you choose to believe God. And as you continue to believe God, you will change the future. You will create a different reality. So here's that bronze serpent story that tied to this little picture that we are drawing here. The mystery of the cross and the resurrection. And uh, here's the cross. Here's the resurrection. How is it that we in the future just keep looking and are changed? But here is the thing. If the methodology is similar to the bronze serpent, then some people might look once and it's done. Some people might have to keep looking for some time before the inner changes take place. 
But what we have done is we have created a formula by which a person accepts Christ as a sinner's prayer. And then we say that's done. But each person is so different. Some people need to take a longer look at the cross and the resurrection and meditate on it until it affects their life. Which is why some Christians when they first accepted Christ, their life continues. Some stumble a while. And it's because we put it in the formula. And we are like going back to Moses' time and telling the people. Okay, each one five seconds. Each one one minute. There was no such rule. As long as they need to look at the bronze serpent, they had to look. And in the vision I saw, there is a few people who actually sat there the whole day. I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they enjoy the view of the front serpent. They, they just, maybe to be sure, whatever. They sat there the whole day until it's night. So why are we telling people that you say one sinner's prayer and your life will change? When some people that will happen, some people need to take a longer look. And as you look, you are transformed. And people need to see what Christ has done. And that's why sometimes when we teach about it, it makes people look again. It turns your knowledge and your mental capacity to look again at the cross. Which is why people have follow-up system and all that. But the main thing is, it's not an intellectual process. It is a spiritual process that goes beyond understanding. The mere seeing and meditation on the cross and the resurrection changes you. That's a powerful thing. Now, that in itself is a mystery. How you can look at something 2,000 years ago and still affect it into your life today. And Paul talks about being identified together with him. You know, Ephesians 2, you're buried together and you are risen together seated together with Christ Jesus so that together you make a life together you identify in his resurrection you identify in the crucifixion so there's some sort of what I call we use the word identification with Christ to be able to see that everything is there and everything he has is yours that is not I repeat is not an intellectual process alone So you can call the most foolish man and the most wisest man and let them sit together and whether they are foolish or wise, low IQ or high IQ, both of them keep looking at, at the bronze serpent with Jesus on the cross and their lives are changed. It's nothing to do with the intellectual process, although the intellectual process might help you. Neither has it to do with the emotional process. They might not feel like doing it, but you've got to do it if you're beaten by the serpent. Whether they feel like it or not, they must come and look. And as they look, how long do they look? They look until they feel good, better. Then some of them laugh and then don't feel well, come back and look. Very strange. So accepting Christ is only the beginning. Being transformed to be like Him. The secret is how to be transformed here. And transformation here is related to your looking here. And the structure and your personality and the kind of person you are, maybe you're one of those three persons, but they come back every, uh, for, for three days looking at a bronze serpent. Maybe you're one of those who just come, look, and then it's done. Maybe you're one of those who come and look the whole day. How come they never told us to do that when we were young Christian? Oh, sinner's prayer, it's yes, done. Go, go. You got it already. Jesus is in your heart. See? We reduce everyone to what I call, how long does it take a sinner's prayer? Maybe let's say one to three minutes. So, like we're reducing everyone to a one to, one to three minute salvation. 
without realizing that everyone is different. That we have to keep looking before we are transformed and changed. Only God knows how each one of us are individually. That's one of the mysteries. But there's another mystery that I want to point to. It refers to Christ and not us. But it affects us because everything that is Christ affects us. So let me draw this other thing. There is the word. Oh, how did I get into that color? Okay, let me change back to black. Black? Okay. Okay. There is the word before he came to the earth. When he came, he was given a name, Jesus. Matthew put Emmanuel. So God with us. So he's Jesus. Because he's the Messiah, we call him the Christ. He lived on earth. He died on the cross. Raised from the dead, and then everything which is the mystery of Christ, everything now must have the cross inside. All creation now must have the cross. Let me point to it, okay, before I show you the little thing. If you type the little word here, call mystery you will find it occurs a lot in the New Testament in Paul's writing especially about the mystery of Christ so here is one in Ephesians 1 verse 9 it talked about the mystery of his will and that is in verse 10 related to Everything gathered together in Christ. God wants a mark of Christ to enter all of heaven and all of the pristine heaven. Even the, the, the heaven that was, didn't fall, the two thirds that didn't fall, had to be renovated, if I can use the word, with the mark of Christ. To enter, they are already perfect, but they enter into a level of perfection. Something happened. So that's a mystery. Uh, in this series, we are talking about end-time mysteries. And um, then, Paul continues to tell us that. In um, chapter 3, he talked about the dispensation of grace. He says, how by revelation he has made known to me the mystery, as I have already written, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Then he unveiled it in verse 5 which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as is revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, and this is a mystery, that Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. The Jews, the Gentiles, all in Christ. At that time, it was very controversial when Paul mentioned it, because everyone thought you have to become a Jew first before you're saved. And... Then he continued talking about this mystery and uh, the mystery of Christ as he unveiled uh, four more results. There it is. In chapter 3, verse 9, uh, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Everything revolves around Christ. The mark of Christ, the DNA, the energizing or something of the Christ spirit and nature and DNA must enter into all of heaven at the throne room, everything else. You see in Philippians chapter 2 when he says, when he ascended on high, God proclaimed, let all things in heaven, all things on earth, all things under the earth bow to the name of Jesus. He made the name of Jesus the main name in heaven and earth because this is a mystery, Paul saw. Everything has to be redone in Christ, even though it's, uh, the, the fallen part of the universe has to be saved and redone. The unfallen part also has to be redone. That's a mystery in Christ. 
The Siva is a fellowship which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ. Actually, the creation was through Christ. Now, it should be made perfect by Christ. That was a mystery that he was trying to bring forth. Uh, the mystery of Christ. And then, of course, this is the first time he used the word, this is a great mystery. How Christ can be one with his bride and wants to be one through the bride with all his creation. So something of Christ must come in. This great mystery. Okay, that's enough. We've got many other passages. Uh, there's a mystery of Godliness and all the other things. But here we come back to this little drawing. Uh, let me use a different color to emphasize some points. Right, yes. Now we know that there was the Word in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. So the Word came down, at least a part of Him. When He came down, the Word was still there, because God can be omnipresent. So it's not like it's, there's a vacuum there. No, when He came down, He's omnipresent. There's Him there, and there's Him here. And uh, so there's Jesus Christ. Something special came when God came in the flesh, right? It used to be special. Never seen before. Mystery of the universe. How in the flesh God can be manifest. That is a mystery. How could God fit all of Him inside that? We saw that in the book of Colossians. That in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead. Remember Colossians chapter 2? Verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, up to verse 11. In Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead. But today, with technology, we can understand a little bit. Your, your phone is more powerful than the first computer. The first computer that was invented was the size of a big room. Maybe it could be as big as this whole hall. If they put all the things. The transistors, the circuit, all are huge. But your phone today is a more powerful computer than a computer that fills the whole room. Because of miniaturization. But today they are trying to invent something even more powerful than our present computer. Because our present computer is actually using uh, uh, bits and bytes, ones and zero. The next computer they're going to invent is a quantum computer, which have more than ones and zeros. They have halfway in between states. So instead of having ones and zeros, you might have four or five or six, depending on how sophisticated they can make it, and then they create faster data calculation. And it's going to be even more powerful. And when they miniaturize it to organic computers, it is even higher. Imagine, it only takes four tiny little proteins to make your DNA. A, C, G, and T. And all of those, all your programming of your DNA is done. How they arrange A, C, G, and T, the proteins. And so you will realize it was a mystery how that can fit into that. And we are all amazed. Now, let me extend a little bit. When Jesus went to the cross, he went in whatever form he was. But we all agree on this, that when Jesus rose from the dead, okay, maybe I should use another color. When Jesus rose from the dead, something was different. And that extends to Him being the right hand of God. So we know that between the cross and the resurrection and the ascension, which is on the same area, 
something changed. And what changed was what we call in Romans chapter 6, the glory of the Father. Romans chapter 6. We are told that when Christ rose from the dead, in verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. <clears throat> So, we see a little diagram here. Something called the glory of the Father was given. Something that was not revealed in the Old Testament. Something new. So that the Bible refers to His resurrection Funnily, as firstborn. Firstborn from the dead. We know physically, Jesus was not the first one resurrected from the dead. Elijah has risen people from the dead. Jesus himself in his earthly ministry has risen people from the dead, including Lazarus. In, including the poor widow whose funeral possession was going on and Jesus came, tapped the coffin and raised the son from the dead. We know that the book of Acts, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. So there are a lot of people risen from the dead and Jesus sent his disciples two by two and he says, preach the gospel, raise the dead. So we assume some of them will have done it, but it's not recorded. So there are a lot of people risen from the dead, but Jesus one was called first. Firstborn. Very easy to find all those places. You just have to type the little verse, a little phrase, firstborn without space, and you will find all of them, the scriptures. And referring to the New Testament, of course. And here you have, like Romans, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So why is the word first referring to him? And it's prototokos. And um, proto from the word first, protos, which I know from the Greek. But uh, tikto, which is like a seed producing a plant. That's why I use the word firstborn. The first that comes up from the ground. Tikto. So it says prototokos, uh, firstborn. That's an interesting word. And uh, so when you have that and you put everywhere in the Greek as it occur, you'll find Colossians 1 15 that says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That's a title that Jesus holds uh, dearly. And um, then, you, of course, you have uh, this one in Hebrews. For when he again brings the firstborn into the world, and that's not talking about Jesus coming on Christmas Day. This is talking about Jesus' resurrection. And the phrase in Psalms chapter, um, here, the phrase is Psalms... Uh, Why you put Samuel there? <laughs> okay, this is the one. Okay, uh, Psalms two seven. Okay, says you are my son. Today I begotten you. 
He might think that that was Christmas Day when he first came. No, no, no. That was when he rose from the dead. Psalm chapter 2. And that is a verse that Paul also used in his preaching. In the book of Acts. He quotes this psalm. And this psalm refers to the resurrection. Who, who would take this, that verse and say, You are my son, today I've begotten you. That looks like a Christmas story. And if they, that's not about the Christmas story when it came. Remember the red circle. Not about the red circle. It's the purple circle. It's how he rose, raised him from the dead. Something was given. Something brought forth. And that's why he's the firstborn. And that continued to be used all the way to the book of Revelation. And his title is the firstborn from the dead. So the puzzle of the word firstborn. And uh, some people say, you know, Jesus was born again. More than that. The word born again could not even refer to all that he has done. So what we are saying is, here is the resurrection, here is the cross. Remember the earlier thing. We had to identify with it. Now, how can you identify it if you don't understand it? Say, oh, just by looking, looking, looking. Well, a lot of people have been looking for 2,000 years. Some are changed differently. But it helps if you understand what actually happens. And it helps you understand what is the process that is taking place when you're looking. So there's something about the cross, something about the resurrection that is different. Yet these two events are tied together in Christ, and both events affect us. We are told in all our Christian life, in both Romans, Colossians, Ephesians, everywhere else, that you're buried with Him, you're risen with Him. Together, together, using the Greek word soon. Together. Your togetherness with Him is an important part of who you become. It's an important part of your being transformed. He always refers back, even when he studied Colossians last night. It says, having been buried with Him, nailed to the cross, only one cross, the one that Jesus died in. Everything referred back to that. And so, uh, looking at this picture again, what is this basis and looking? That's why I draw two arrows. Because you're looking at two different things. Remember what Paul says, that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings and his resurrection power. That I may know him. I want to know him. But you cannot know him without these two. So what is this process of looking? We know there is an illustration in the bronze serpent. So in the bronze serpent, as they look, as they look, they will change. So the link is the looking, but they don't have a resurrection. They only have this. The cross. Because they didn't have any resurrection thing. They only have Jesus lifted up on the cross. As they look, something changed. Which you can analyze in different ways to understand the mystery. One is emphasized in the word look. And for those who are a bit more scholarly, who always ask for more details and all that. Okay. You might want to go to Numbers 21. And uh, Okay, Numbers 21. Okay, my thing is responding very slow. Okay. And say... Okay, what does it mean to look? How to look? Okay, Hebrew word for look. Ra'ah. A primitive root to see, literally, figuratively. 
and to be whole, to enjoy, to discern, to experience, to gaze, to joyfully look, to be near, to think, to view, to stare. Look at all these words. In the authorized translation, um, wow, it occurred 1,313 times in the Old King James. 879 times is translated as look. 83 times as behold, then show in other areas. But it looks like a very simple word that includes the word stare, visualize, vision, see, behold, glance, and experience, feel, look joyfully, all these other words that come in. And that was all they needed to do. So when anyone was beaten, when they look, hey, there are two Hebrew words. One is the word, when he looks, ra'ah. Here is, when he look, nabat, which means to scan, to look intently at, by implication, to regard with pleasure, favor, and care. To behold, consider, regard, have respect, to see. 69 times the word Nabat occur in the Hebrew. 36 times translated as look. 13 times translated as behold. 5 times as the word consider. Consider means what you're looking, you're thinking. And, uh, Four times as the word regard. Four times as see. Three times as respect. Two times as look down. One time as look about. One time to look back. Nabat. But the root of it means to pay attention. And uh, let me see if there is more uh, depth to that. Oh, I don't, it, it doesn't come out that much. But Nabat. To look intently. Okay, it's the same thing again. And so it's like to look until you feel something. Whoa. Now you know why some of the people look for a long time. Then when that applied to looking at Jesus, how come we are not took to, taught, taught to look at the cross? Plus the resurrection. Because they only got the cross. We got the cross and resurrection. You got two things to look. Because the resurrection, the cross is separated by three days. The cross is important. Every time we talk about resurrection, it's always talk about being buried with him baptism. It looks like for us, we're looking at two things. The cross and the resurrection. So the fact here is a big picture is still telling us this. Number one, you have to look. Nabat or Ra'ah. I saw in vision, some people go, you know, they come, go and come for a few days. Right? Like they're not assured. Just like we say, some people, when you say the sinner's prayer, you still doubt. I was one of those. It took me a while before I was more firm. Perhaps there's more things inside to rearrange. than someone, you know, who might not question so much. I question everything. And if you ask me exactly what day or date I was born again, I couldn't tell you. Because it's like over a period of time, I became assured of salvation. Yeah, I don't even remember the exact day. But some people, their salvation is very dramatic. Exact day, exact minute, exact hour. They knew what time they were born again. I, I couldn't tell you. Maybe some of you are the same like me. Yeah, but you know that you're born again. Do you know John Wesley also didn't know? Remember John Wesley, when he came to the faith and he came to understand salvation by grace, he was still a doubting Thomas, although his name was John. <laughs> when he was on the boat together with the Moravian Christian. And he even shared with them, he said, hey, I'm actually talking about Christ, but I like, don't have this assurance, full assurance. 
and the Moravians, who were very spiritual at that time, because there was a leader called uh, Lord Zinzin Duff or whatever, and they had a revival, they committed to the Lord, said, you believe, keep preaching what you believe until you feel it. <laughs> and that's what he did. And who today dared to say John Wesley was not born again? But he has to preach what he believed, even though he don't feel because he was right, until he really felt the assurance. And you read his journals, which is many, many volumes, which I read through. Somewhere in his preaching, he was so assured of salvation that he knew he was safe. But he doubted at the beginning. So, how long you must look until Nabat comes? From Ra'ah to Nabat, using Hebrew words. And as you're looking at the two, remember, in the next drawing we saw these two are different. But that's looking. And then there's this uh, transformation. In the Old Testament, if something happened in their body as they look. Transform. That the two are connected to one another. The looking and the transform. But the connection is not the same for everyone. Some people, they look and they immediately got it. Some people, they look the whole day. Some people, they took a few days to keep coming and looking. Until they felt satisfied that they are completely cured. Although it was linked, it was different for each person. That explains why some of you need to go through different cycles for your transformation. The most important thing is not how long or when. It is until you are satisfied. So we have to be able to visualize the cross, be able to visualize the resurrection, until the transformation is completed. And these are the words for those of you who are struggling in your Christian life. And it refers to some of them who have been writing to me, like Angel and some of the others. You only had to keep looking at the cross. Maybe you need to look longer. Forget about what you think. Forget about what you feel. Forget about everything else. Just keep looking at Jesus on the cross and the resurrection. But you have a disadvantage. Disadvantage number three. It's not there physically. It would have been easy if you were if you were in Jesus' time and he was actually hanging on the cross and you're looking at him together with John and, our, and, and his mother. Because there's no picture. There's no solidness. In Moses' time, they had a solid serpent to look at. Bronze, solid serpent. So we have a disadvantage, point three. Whatever you're looking at is conceptual and no one can actually produce the right picture. No movie of Jesus, no painting by any artist could ever express the cross. None. Because nobody knew what Jesus looked like. Nobody even know how the cross looked like. Some people put, you know, the nails, on his, uh, what is this, his wrist, instead of on his palm. There's all this debate going on. So, how to draw, how to be accurate. See, you have a problem number three that you didn't know. And that's a serious problem. You know why? Because everything is based on looking. The transformation was based on looking. 
So if number three, there's nothing to look at. You're in trouble. Of course, Jesus by His grace can give you a vision of the cross. He can show it to you in some way. Paint it some way your imagination. And so I put here, the problem is, it is a spiritual concept. Can you see now why we need to look longer? Because spiritual things for many people don't exist. It's airy fairy, not tangible. Now, if it's a spiritual concept that is left, no one knows what Jesus looked like, no one knows what the cross looked like, no one knows what actually the resurrection looks like. So what else do we have to help us paint picture number one? Everything starts with that looking. If this part is affected, then this part transformation is affected. Which means number three, the clearer you conceive and the clearer you see will mean a feedback loop to one. That's why you have songs like Fill my eyes, oh my God with a vision of the cross. And something move inside you. Remember when you were a young Christian, you got a lot of songs about the cross? I remember one that really made me cry long ago is, you know, Were you there when they crucify my Lord? Were you there? And then when I hear it, the young kids say, it made me cry. And remember, I'm one of those who don't have much emotions. I was more intellectual. But it can make me cry. What I didn't know was, I wish someone had taught me, was that that song was helping me to see Jesus. But not a painting. It was something in my heart that my mind, imagination hasn't caught yet. If it's strong enough to make you cry, that means it's a picture forming. Even though your mind and your imagination don't see the picture yet. Because it's taking place in the spiritual. It's a spiritual conception. And then when they reach the place where they say, Oh, then you start weeping even more profusely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, about sin. Those are born. Okay, give us the verse. Now, since none of us, and no artist, no painter, can produce, and I would not recommend doing it, even if though I've seen vision of Jesus and all those things, I would not recommend painting him and all that, because you become something artificial. How do I know when a painting is there? The painting doesn't begin in your mind. It begins in your heart which comes, this principle number three, spiritual conception, is found in the book of uh, Hebrews 11. Let me show the steps on it, so that each one of you will know that part. It's talking about um, faith, verse 13. 
These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Having, number one, seen them afar. Number two, embraced them. Number three, confess. <coughs> then, it completes the process. So, we say number one, receive, number two, see, number three, embrace, number four, confess. Now notice, even the seeing is seeing from afar. And they refer to the Old Testament, of course. The Old Testament, when they look at the New Testament thing, they see from afar. But reverse is true. If they see us from afar and we look back, they are also very far. Because geographically, it's the same distance. And now the distance between us and Jesus is measured by nearly 2,000 years. So, how do we get that picture? It is not a real picture that is painted in your mind or imagination. Although through time, you might see it. If Jesus gives you a vision of the cross, or you meet Jesus in vision, then of course it helps. But until then, how do we progress? Number one, receive the promise. You just know the word. The word says, I'm crucified with Christ, I'm buried with Him, I'm raised together with Him. I believe the word. The word has no picture painted yet. But the word begins to form something in your heart that you can see. When you see from afar, you don't have all the details. All you know is the cross, and everyone knows what a cross looks like. You might not know the details of the cross, but you know what a cross looks like. That's seeing from afar. If you've seen Jesus from one mile away, you might not recognize whatever is on the cross. You only see the shape of the wood. That's still not bad. At least it's in your heart. You never say, see from near, see from far. So as you see from far, then number three is embrace. Number four is confess. Embrace means you're feeling something. Feeling something. And so, what was the secret of Christian life that I wish somebody had told me when was a young Christian? That when they were singing those songs on the cross, I should have waited and meditated and waited and meditated and let it be more complete. Remember? Many of us only have a few minutes of those experience. The people looking at a bronze serpent sometimes have hours the whole day. Sometimes they watch for three days. Well, I wonder what it would be like eh, if, if you felt the cross and that song, Oh, were you there when they crucified the Lord? And you're there, and you're just waiting there, and the church didn't close its doors and remain open. They didn't chase you out because service was over. And they just let you remain there for a whole day and remain as long as you want. Meditate. Oh, with such a place, 24 hours. And there you are meditating. And perhaps you're there with 24 hours. Very good. You spend three whole days there. And you're just meditating and seeing strongly and stronger, I can tell you, you might come out of that totally transformed. That might have taken three to ten years of possible backsliding out of you. Now you see what I mean. Because we don't understand that mystery, we did not apply. Now here's what happened. Something God is painting a picture in your life that caused you to embrace it. The picture is not so clear, it's seen from afar. But embracing means you're feeling it. Now when you're feeling it and you talk about it, that seals the whole process. That's a process of faith. And you confess with full meaning. Before, you might be like John Wesley, preaching without really feeling assured. But after he feel assured and he preached, it was also different. It became more powerful. So that process of faith is important. When you are deeply moved, Something is touching the core of your, of your inner being. When something makes you deeply move, 
even though you're intellectually divorced from that feeling, it's still shaking you at the core. Let it finish its work. Let it finish its work. Because most likely a painting was being done in your heart before it floats into your mind and imagination. When it comes to your mind and imagination, then you can see very clearly. But until then, it's just in your heart. When God causes His light to shine. That is why you can see number three is a very important development, especially for us today. Who have no benefit of feeling the bronze serpent. I mean, in Moses' time, you could go very near and even touch it, if you allow it. If, if you had lived during the time of Jesus, you would actually see what a cross looked like, because it was a common way they crucified criminals. And then to see Jesus, to know Him, what a privilege it was. But Jesus Himself said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That means He gives a greater blessing for those who just believe because of the Word. But even though we believe the Word, which is the promises, and receive it, you must see from afar, embrace and confess. Then the process of faith is complete inside you. And that's the reason why Christians are weak today. Why they, are, they don't have full assurance. They're walking about with quarter assurance, 10% assurance. They're walking about because of what the words of society. They believe because somebody told them, not because they experience. Remember, the word Nabat includes your personal experience. It is not their testimony, it's a testimony of somebody else. But when you experience something yourself, it becomes your experience, which is why I always tell people, Whatever people say about these end time angels and all that, I have been transported by the angels. I cannot deny it as an experience. I cannot even question the reality because I've been transported 100 kilometers while driving a car. I cannot deny the reality of following the end time move and having it change because it was a real personal experience. When it's a real personal experience, no one can take that out from you. You know it's real. You know it's true. And you are defy the laws of physics. And if we can defy it once, you can defy it again and again and again. So it's important to personally experience the doctrines and the revelations. So we clarify that part, but this is just foundation for something I'm about to tell you. You see what? This is not it. No, this is not it. This is a simple truth. This is not it yet. This is just understanding how to assess a mystery. Let me tell you what the actual mystery here. It's here. The next phase. Having understood that, now you apply those points to here. And uh, so... Let's put us standing here. Here you are, looking at the cross, Jesus, the cross, and the resurrection, and sitting at the right hand of God. Remember, you're applying, that's why you use the same color orange. Now you're applying all the three points to one, two, three, four. Whoa! Just now I was just teaching you how to use your tools, which is built on your inside. The faith tools that God has placed in each one of you when you're born again. The ability to see God in your heart, which is, when you see God in your heart, it's actually through your feelings. Because when you feel something, it's becoming very real to you. And the picture is being painted. One day, it's painted in your imagination, in your mind, then you can see it clearly. Of course, if Jesus gives you a dream or vision, then it's tremendous. I remember an elderly Christian who loved God very much and for a long, long time always pray fast, pray fast, pray fast, pray fast. Until one day, the person had a dream. In a dream, he saw Jesus being crucified on the cross, saw himself there, 
and he woke up with tears. So I said, Jesus has touched you. Now that is an experience no one can take. There is something, now as you see, you are transformed. By the time it happened in a dream, it's so real. So real. My father, who is in heaven right now, had a dream of the cross when he attended one, at that time I was in a Baptist seminary choir, so at the end of every year, before the holidays, we do choir tours all through all the Baptist churches and some Presbyterian church, it was the one that is my hometown. So we went to the church and then I didn't know my father attended the choir presentation. But he then, because I went on to Singapore and we went to several churches before we got our holidays. But when I went back, he told me he attended and he said, on the night that I attended, I had a dream. I dreamed that there was a big, huge cross, and I, I was at the foot of the cross. And then I described it to him. And then he told me another thing. He says, for about six months or so, I've been praying the little pamphlet you left behind. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. It's a sinner's prayer based on Campus Crusade for spiritual laws. Then I told him, Pa, you're born again. Jesus answered the prayer. You, you, Jesus is now in your heart. And I got the privilege of baptizing him in the Straits of Johor. He took on the name Patrick. So, it is this kind of experience where the picture becomes so real, it comes out in your dream or vision. But it's something that moves you from deep inside. When you keep moving you, I can assure you, the picture is coming. So if only somebody taught me when I was young, and whenever, you know, they sing the song, Were you there when they crucified the Lord? Were you there? And I go, ah. Now I don't cry so much because I've seen other things of God. Although I'm still deeply moved. I think all the tears were there all finished out running. But it was important that I cry. No one told me that I should continue in it. If I continue it, who knows, it might come out in my dream. And I might see a picture in my heart. But remember, this is what actually creates transformation and makes you who you are. And because people are not allowing it to finish, they struggle in their life. Remember, Christianity is not a struggle if you become first and then you do. It is only a struggle if you try to become and you keep trying to do. Christianity is becoming and then whatever you, you become, it flows out of who you are. As the root is good, so will the fruit be. If the root is not fully formed, the fruit cannot fully form. So a lot of Christians struggle because the transformation is not finished, they're trying to do something. They're not sitting at the feet of Jesus to be transformed. But here we got four things. Now, if we identify with Jesus here and here, and we identify with Jesus here and here, we need to understand the difference between how he got from here to here. Although we don't have the dime on the cross because he did it for us, we don't have to rise on the dead because we identify with him rising, but we need to fully understand what happened for it to come into our life. There's a mystery you must understand. Now, the purple side here is something new. It's new creation and new Jerusalem glory. This purple glory belongs to new heaven, new earth. That came with Jesus. That's why he was the firstborn. He's the first of the new heaven, new earth. And everyone who comes under that him becomes the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. Of the new heaven, new earth. 
He was first, then the first fruits, and then those of Christ that is coming. To partake of that. We know that Jesus was different there and here. We know that Jesus is different here and here, and we're going back there. The question and understanding is, how did Jesus transform? Because how he transformed is how we transform since you identify with him. You are not going to transform by yourself. You're going to transform according to how Jesus transformed. Isn't that what it means? You are buried with him. You die with him. You are risen with him. You are, are seated together with him. Correct? So you need to understand how he moved from there, 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 so that the same thing as he is, so are you. Not independent from him, but as he was transformed. This is the greatest mystery. And God showed me the secret. How? You already learned How to look. How to look. But here, you learn at looking at the actual details of how he transformed. That means getting closer. Because as much as you can see, so are you. Now, Jesus, the Word becoming our Lord Jesus in the flesh, that one comes to being born again. Just as the Father is in Him, that one very simple, He teaches. Just as the Father is in Him, He is in us. So there's a mystery. Somehow all of Jesus is in us. And then we know from Ephesians chapter 3, you can pray and strengthen your spirit man, pray for your spirit man to be strengthened, so that as your spirit man is strengthened, more of Jesus can dwell. So His dwelling in us, we know that mystery, we have solved that. It is based on Ephesians chapter 3. It is based on the strength of your spirit man. Your spirit man is a container for Jesus' presence in you. The mystery we have solved is a different teaching. And, but we need to solve this area of us looking at how Jesus transformed that. We know for Jesus, it is Him coming in the flesh, which is John uh, chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh. So here in Ephesians 3, the Word is still plays an important role. More of the Word, more of the Word, more of the Word. You keep telling you, more of the Spirit, more of the Word. The effect of the Word in you and the effect of the Spirit are the same. Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.18.19 are the same. Speaking in sounds here in spiritual song. Let the Word of God dwell richly in you. So the more the Word transform in you, how is your spirit mind strengthened? By the Word. The food for your spirit man is the word. The more word you have, the more your spirit man grows. So you just keep feeding your spirit man the word, your spirit man will grow stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And the stronger your spirit man, the more the presence of God can dwell in you. That mystery we have solved, the other side. So you know how to have this. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But how to have this one? How did Jesus move from here into this one? How to have the resurrection life and being seated at the right hand of God? Always you look at what Jesus do. Here the, to here, the Word became flesh. So the Word must become flesh in us. 
Our spirit man, Ephesians 3, it tells us the technical thing is our spirit man, and the spirit man needs the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We are told many times, feed on the word, feed on the word. And uh, even Peter mentioned, now, as newborn babes desire the milk of the word, until you learn to eat solid food, so we have to keep growing. So as we grow spiritually, God can contain in your life more and more. Your spiritual growth is the most important thing. Sadly, many Christians do not pursue spiritual growth. What's important, when uh, Jehuda was picking me up today, we were just, we always have interesting conversation. And uh, so, we're talking about different things. Then, I, then we're talking about God and the revival and the move of God. And then he said, if you don't have this move, what do we have? Traditional Christianity. Then if you don't have traditional Christianity, what do we have? Nothing. You go back to the world. Eat, sleep, drink, pleasure. Eat, sleep, drink, pleasure. Boring. You know, it's, it's a boring life. There's nothing. It will be exactly Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. After you enjoy it, now all vanity. It's re repetition, the same thing. You get tired of that kind. Some people don't get tired, but you get tired of that kind of life. So there'll be something else, which is why I said, you know, uh, we have to be passionate about the things of God. And what are we passionate about? I'm passionate about Christ. And uh, I don't want a boring life, eat, sleep, drink, you know. I don't want that kind of life. Maybe in the world, some people think that's good enough. That's why they are where they are. How much you grow spiritually have to be what we call hunger for God. What do you hunger for? Some people, all they hunger for is a good physical life. That's why they're satisfied. Whatever you set your goal, you will stop there. You're going to set your goal higher to know God, to want to know more of God, or to be like God. Then you can progress higher. Unfortunately, when you drive your car, you need to know the direction. Have you driven a car without knowing where to go? You wouldn't know where to drive, you'd be in circles or just, you know, just wasting, wasting the, the petrol in the car, just driving around. Everyone who sits in a car, sits in a car to go somewhere. So if all you're doing and you're aiming only a short distance, that's all. You'll be just driving your car to a short distance. Your car is your body, your life. Where do you want your life to be? Where do you want to go? I would not be satisfied with anything lesser than knowing all the fullness of God in this world, in this life. To live closer to God on the earth. So depend on where you aim. It's important to aim correctly. So aiming here is important. But here is a boundary which to now to show how to cross this boundary into here. And it's not, it's good news, but it's not the news that you might like. Because you need to look at how Jesus moved from here to here. And it's so simple. He gave his entire life for us. Now, Jesus never withheld one iota. When he went to the cross, he was prepared to give his whole life. To share everything that he had with the Father, withholding nothing back. He did not even just give a small part of himself and say the other parts I cannot give you. Never. You know the verses like heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Verses like where I am, I will bring you to in my father's house. That where, where I am, I want to bring you to be where I am with the father. Do you realize Jesus had nothing back? He gave 100%. And 
was given. That's why God the Father brought him here. Now you know why the cross is called the cross. What does the cross mean to you? Something that saves you? Then you are only touching the bottom of the cross. What does the cross mean to you? The cross means the end of all your life as you know it. Because the cross to Jesus means absolute surrender, holding nothing back. And let me write out the tiny little points, if I can squeeze a little space there. Let me try to squeeze a space there. And use this. Uh, okay, let me use. Okay. Blue color will do. It means, number one, unconditional love. Because he loved us while we were yet sinners. He even loved the people who were crucifying him. Saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they have done. So Jesus crossed the boundary. Oops, I was going to draw here. True, unconditional love. There was not one selfish bone inside him. He loved and he gave all. Of course, God, to see that come to pass, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God has to exercise that up here in John 3.16. Jesus on the earth has to exercise, though we were yet sinners, he died for us. While we were enemies of God, he died for us. He died for his enemy. Dying for a friend, Jesus says, anyone can do for a loved one. Remember when he started teaching. He's saying, loving someone who loves you, normal. Loving an enemy, that's New Testament. So, unconditional love having crossed over. And total surrender to God's will. Having crossed over. Jesus had to totally surrender everything. Do you know Jesus had to surrender to the mercy of the Father to raise him from the dead? And he was willing to do that. He did not have a single selfish bone in him. And even more, did not even have a single selfish atom or molecule. Every fiber of his being was total, unconditional, surrendered love. In a way, Jesus gave us his life. That's why he's talking about the shedding of blood. His blood is his life. Now, today when people do transfusion and, or, or, or organ donation, they will not take another life. They will sort of, um, might take half of the liver or take part of the blood and then both person can live. But you know for Jesus, only one person can live. He was prepared to give his life for us and surrender himself to the Father. His blood was shed, represent his life. The lamb has to die. 
and the lamb was willing to die. He said, if anyone does not eat my flesh and drink my blood, he cannot live. That means he's willing to be eaten. Quote, unquote. Of course, symbolically. In other words, he's willing to just give the manifestation of this life totally away. Giving his life for us. Holding nothing back. That's why he crossed over. Now let me illustrate here. If you really want transformation, you must reach the point where you are pure, unconditional love. There's not a single selfish love in you. Do you know why? What does it mean to be like God? When we, when this life is over, and we are like gods, it won't be like the fallen gods of the mythologies of the Greeks and all the other things. Those are selfish, horrible, satanic, fallen angels who try to behave like gods. But the true, trueness of being like God is this. All creation is like your hand. You're giving, your blood is pumping to the hand. Your life is giving the hand life. Even though it's separated from you. Being like God in eternity is that we become instruments of God and you no longer live for yourself. You find your life by living for the creation of God. That gives you meaning. You ask a tree, why do you want to be a tree? The tree tells you, I was made to be a tree, I was made to bear fruit, I was made this, and I will give my entire life to be a tree, and I exist for the sake of feeding mankind. And the tree is happy, because it's a tree. But a tree is a tree. God wants to make us like Him. The whole universe is right now breathing because of the life of God. As all biological life today is sustained by the sun, so all the life in the universe is sustained by the essence of God. <laughs> flow into the universe. And you want to be like God? You must be pure essence of giving. So that to, to everyone, to great, to small, to selfish people, to unselfish people, to good people, to bad people, God give rain. All you have is benevolence, goodness, the essence of the goodness of God, then you're like God. And God gives you the greater capacity. That's why New Jerusalem, you become the foundations, the gates, the walls, etc. Not to exist for yourself anymore, but to exist sustaining all of creation. Then you're like God. So Jesus crossed over by unconditional love, by total surrender of all his being, every atom of his being, and by giving his actual life. In this world, people are afraid of that. Because they think when they give, they got less. But how many times in the Bible that tells you that it's more blessed to give than to receive? That the more you give, the more you get your supply. And here's the secret. How much of God's life flows through you depends on how much you, of God's life is flowing out from you. If you withhold it just for your selfish enjoyment, then nothing flows out. 
you're stuck in a place of self-satiation and not true godliness of self-giving. Which is why this principle is tied to resurrection. Remember? Uh, let me show the picture again. This is resurrection. This is ascension. The Godhead sitting at the right hand of God. What do you think the right hand of God is doing? It's just giving out life. It's not calling attention to itself. Your own right hand and your own left hand is not calling attention to itself. When you're using your hand, is your hand calling attention to itself? No. When you're eating food, you use your hand. You don't even realize your hands are there because you're enjoying the food. It's only when your hand don't function properly then you realize your hands is so useful. But yet everything you do depends on your hands, your legs, your eyes. When one part of your body doesn't function properly, then you realize how useful they are. While they are functioning, if they are functioning well, they are invisible. Because while you are eating your chak kway tiao, you are eating your wonton noodle, you are eating your steak, with your fork and knife, or whatever style you are eating, you are not conscious of your hands, you are conscious of the meat, or what you are eating. That's the pure essence and the beauty of being like God. You're invisible while everything depends on you. Pure, unselfish love flowing out, which is the secret of resurrection power. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, why does Paul link the two together all the time? He says, verse 10, Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal body. So then death is working in us, but life in you. In other words, Paul says, we are dying for you. That's what he's saying. We are dying for you. Our whole life is dying for you. It's a cross we are taking, we are choosing death, we are choosing inconvenience, we are choosing all these things because the only purpose of us living is for you. It's almost like a father and mother saying, right, many good natural father and mother, they live your entire life many times. The good ones, I know, I know bad ones who don't do that, they live for their children. The sacrifice for the children. If there's not enough food or money, they sacrifice so the children will have enough. That is a type of the way God's love. God loved us so that God gave Himself. That is true godliness. And crossing the boundary. Now many people don't dare to die on the cross for others. Which is why... John understood this principle. There is John 3.16 there. To cross over to this area is 1 John 3.16. There is no greater love than a man has for another than to lay down his life for another person. There is Jesus laying down his life for us. There is God giving his son. There is Jesus laying down his life for us. There is we laying our life down for others. How many people are willing to in themselves say they will keep giving their life for others? That is the true meaning of ministry. The true meaning of being a good shepherd. The true meaning of being a good leader. And the true meaning of having resurrection power and life. And the true meaning of what it means to be God or God-like. To be God-like is to live for your creation. Because you don't need your creation to live. You really are God. 
But when God created the creation, he, the creation is His baby. He gave everything to the baby, like a good father and mother. So when you have a glimpse of that, you understand how to tap on the resurrection power. The mystery of Christ and the mystery of the resurrection. The mystery of Christ is that here, He is receiving from God. Here, He is giving. And everything that He has here was created by God for Him to dwell in. Remember, a body He has prepared. From the day that He came, that body was created to be sacrificed. In Hebrews chapter 10, which talks about the Christmas day. So Christmas day is mentioned more. In Hebrews 10, when it says, and this is when he actually came in the flesh, when the word became flesh. Therefore when he came into the world, in verse 5, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you no pleasure. Behold, I have come in a volume of the book, it's written of me, to do your will. So, in verse 10, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Do you know that the body that was created was for one purpose and one purpose alone, to be sacrificed? He's the Lamb. The very purpose... Why he became this is to be sacrificed. Oh. What's your body for? Oh, to enjoy eating durians, one time or huh. You have not fully understood what being a temple of God is. Roman 12, verse 1. Present your body as a living sacrifice. That means you no longer live for your pleasure. Your pleasure is derived from serving and giving to others. Your pleasure is derived from unconditional love. Now, it is the very opposite of sin nature. It's the very opposite of what this world is built upon. Our world is built upon a democracy of selfishness. So democracy is the art of proportioning each selfishness in its proportion so one doesn't control the other. That's why true democracies cannot work because selfishness is still there. The moment it is not in control, it becomes anarchy. Because unless a person is born to love, born to exist for others, think about it. You and I were created to exist within a body, within an ecosystem of which the ecosystem depends on us, on every part of the ecosystem. Every part dependent on one another. And when we discover our place in the ecosystem of God's universe, and you live purely to fulfill your role in that ecosystem, you understand where you are. But this world is topsy-turvy. People exist for themselves, their own end. To actually cross this boundary, not many can cross it over. It's to learn like what Paul says, and he used these words, I die daily, he says. And you look at the church history, all the great men and women of God have been great in ex at bringing forth signs and wonders and power, it's because they die daily. 
Catherine Kuhlman herself used these words. I die a thousand deaths. Those who haven't understood this truth will never touch on the resurrection power. Those who think that resurrection power is just a position to be adulated, saluted, recognized, they just do not know the mystery of the resurrection. The mystery of the resurrection is this. That's why it's a mystery. Though you die, you live. And if you live for yourself, you die, according to Jesus. Didn't Jesus say before his resurrection, the seed must die in order for the plant to come out? And how long you have been a Christian? And I ask you this other question. I won't ask how long you are a Christian. I will ask how unselfish have you become through the years? It's the right question. Because your true measurement of your growth is how you become more and more selfless. And that is a true becoming of God likeness. And you are willing to take the plunge all the way. To live a life of pure essence of love. Of unconditional. And to put the word unconditional because humans tend to be very conditional. So that your pure essence, your love for everyone is always equal, unconditional. Not dependent on who they are, but depending on the love of God flowing through you. And the more you give out, the more you receive. The more brilliant your life. Jesus attained a hundred percent pure and selfish love. The last hurdle was when he took the cup. And the father was saying, would you still be willing to do that? And he said, yes. And that was why when the Lord Jesus asked me, with all these Exodus things that are coming, would you still do it if no one said thank you and if there were people who were ungrateful? I say, yes, Lord, because they don't know what they are going through they still need to be saved. They are like little kindergarten kids. And like children, you know, once you save them, all that, they forget about all these things and then they just do their own thing. Still they need to be saved. To taste of the fullness of the resurrection life of God and enter this dimension, you, we must enter the cross. And understand how to release it and cross over. So talking about looking at Jesus, the more you look at what Jesus and if you find it hard to do, keep looking at Jesus. Let him be your example. As you see how he do it. And church history is full of men and women of God who have died for others. Some people died to translate the Bible. Some people died to bring the gospel to hard places. Some people died in order to teach people the word. Paul himself was martyred. Peter was martyred. There are a lot of martyrs. And that is why Jesus told Peter, the day will come when you will have to die for me. But to die for Jesus actually is dying for those whom Jesus loved. It's to die for people. And that is the secret to cross over. It's always tied to dying, always tied to the cross. 
and you have to keep looking at Jesus and keep seeing it and the more you see the more you become willing and then don't just simply run out and then die but ask Jesus where to lay your life where to lay down your life as a living sacrifice and each of us must find a place where Jesus tells you to lay down your life and you lay down your life so that people can walk on you and pass into safety that's why the apostles and prophets are to be the foundation of the earth it will take time it's not going to be overnight but through time you know while people are thinking of common things that sin and all those things you've gone beyond that stage whenever you have a selfish thought you really feel condemned and you quickly remove it and you're on a higher level than other people who are still struggling with what is wrong, what is right for you, you're gone beyond that your whole life belongs to God and you're more in the area that if you have one selfish thought you realize it is not me it is no more me because you have become exactly like Christ how does Christ think? how does Christ feel? that is why there is power when you reach that stage what kind of power? you can never be discouraged anymore because discouragement is a form of selfishness and a form of self-pity how to be discouraged when you already actually give your life to not exist for itself and then nobody is paying you attention nobody is encouraging you no, everyone taking you for granted yeah you're not discouraged because you already died on the cross and you say, yeah, wonderful, this is wonderful. And there's no loneliness because God is with you and you're in the perfect will of God. You remember, the perfect will of God cannot come in Romans 12 verse 2 without Romans 12 verse 1. Your life is a living sacrifice. And you're powerful because you're not afraid of anyone if a person is prepared to die what else is a person afraid of? nothing because life and death is it and you're willing to lay down your life you're not afraid of poverty poverty compared to death is nothing you're not afraid of need or wants or lack you're not afraid of the lack of clothing or the abundance of clothing you're not afraid of whether you got a good place to stay or no place to stay because you are dying for others you're not living for yourself anymore all self is dead if you happen to have something, fine you happen not to have it, also fine you reach a point of the most powerful place to be godlike and brethren that is when you see the greatest power there are few men and women of God who reach that stage you know Moses even Elijah now Elijah had to work through his issues Remember at one time, Elijah has given himself, given himself, sacrifice, 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 until he feel, I'm the only one. Let me die. <laughs> and then God says, there's 7,000 more. But that was the last time he ever felt that. And the rest of the time, he is Elijah who stands in the presence of God. He asks for nothing more. If you still have earthly goals in this life, early ambitions in this life, by all means be responsible where you need to be responsible for others under your circumference of care. But deep within your inner being, you must die. 
And the day you never ask again for one atom of selfishness, you will be the happiest person on the planet. Because you're satisfied just to exist like a tree for others. You know, sometimes when you walk through the forests or trees or jungles and all those areas, like when I was in US, we went to this big tree near to, I realized that uh, um, Philadelphia is a historic place. It used to be capital of USA from uh, uh, 1790 to 1800. So when we were there near the place where we, we, we sort of have a small little altar, and I saw this big tree, the tree is about this size. I look at I say, well, this tree, after all, you know, America is only about two, three hundred years old. This tree must be growing from a tiny little sapling and must have seen a lot of things. But people might not have noticed the tree as they go by, but the tree has always existed. Just a few, uh, you know, a short distance from the, from the river. It must have seen a lot of things happen. Wars come and go, but it remains. The same way, you're just like a tree. All of us are like trees planted by the rivers of water. You just keep bearing your fruit in its season, and you keep giving your life to the cause and to Christ, and to the cause of Christ. And each time you're giving your life and giving your life and giving your life, and at first, it might feel strange to you. But after some time, you understand this is what life is. Life exists for others. A tree doesn't exist for itself. An animal doesn't exist for itself. Those that exist for itself in a fallen world, they die. Those that exist for others, they live forever. You want to live forever. You want the resurrection life flow through you exists like God exists for His creation. And this absolute place of being is a rest that nothing can touch you. Because the devil is frightened of that. The devil is pure selfishness. And the gods that you read about in mythologies or all these are selfish, horrible gods who do horrible things. They do not know what God-likeness is like. That's why Satan will always be a failure. Fallen angels will be a failure because they exist for their selfish end. And that's why God will continue to be a success because God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and all the Godhead exist for their creation. Think about it. A God who is willing to give up His only begotten Son. A Son of God who is willing to give up His entire life. Create a race of beings who are willing to be like them. We, the manifest sons of God. So when you say Jesus, the Son of God, He was the Lamb of God. When you say the church are sons and daughters of God. We are lambs willing to give our life as a sacrifice for others. So that you see nothing, but the Father sees you and He pours His glory even greater into you. When we reach eternity and we cross over into the other dimension of new heaven, new earth, you will understand this message better. Because then you can actually see the glory of the pureness of light. And the greatest transparency that you have, with the greatest amount of the fullness of God's glory coming through you, will be directly proportional to how pure essence and selflessness you have become then your light will be the brightest in the universe as the light of the Lamb of God. That's the mystery of Christ and the mystery of the resurrection. Simple truth, 
but must be absorbed into us. But don't forget the first part of the teaching. You must see until you move. You must see until all your feelings. Cry every tear. At first when you die for others and you're persecuted for others, you cry. But you cry until the picture is painted clearly. Until your tears become tears of joy. Like Jesus. When Jesus went to the cross, do you see him crying? Do you see Jesus crying? Did Jesus cry on the cross? Why didn't Jesus cry on the cross? He cried all his cry in intercession. You know what Jesus was feeling when he walked the walk to the cross? Joy. It was that joy and peace that's operating in him. You don't believe that? Read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. For the joy that was before him, he went to the cross. Because he had cried finish. On the cross, he was just stay fast. He knew he was just giving his life. All the tears were finished. It was painful what he went through. But it was pure joy. It was the joy of giving himself to us. He had to think about it. This was the one moment when he actually died for us. And it was not a cry of agony. It was not a cry of despair. It was not a cry of pain. It was a cry of joy when he said, it is finished. All his tears he poured out at Gethsemane. And it was like he said like his face was like a stone to give every atom of his being to us. He was now the lamb. No complaints. But inside his heartbeat was beating with pure joy. And this was his greatest opportunity to give himself for the whole universe. Why we call it a mystery? Because it was done in time, but it spread throughout all of eternity. The moment became quantum time that filled the universe. A pure, unselfish act. 2,000 years of church history, when you go to heaven, I went to the archives of heaven, and it records the greatest moments of Christianity on earth. You know what it was like? In some of them were a single prayer that breathed all of a person's life. Like when Wifi was being burned, he says, Open the eyes of the King of England. <laughs> it was like that was why he died. That was why he wanted to live. Or when Stephen says, Lord, do not lay this charge on them. Oh, that was the unselfish prayer that ring out, that touches the very heart of God. When pure, unselfish love flows out, it is recorded as the greatest moments that change Christianity. And this end time are going to be filled with the most unselfish, sacrificial people who are called sons of God. They will have tremendous power but none of this power is used for selfish end. They cannot be tempted to turn the stones into bread because they don't live for themselves anymore. 
They cannot be tempted to use the power for silver and gold because they do not desire silver and gold. Like Peter says, your money perish with you. They did not desire fame or recognition because these are worldly things for them. They rather have their names known by God and the angels than by all the kings and presidents and prime ministers of the world. They do not feel lonely because they know behind them are more angels than the population of humankind. This is the group that God is raising. If you can see the vision, then you can understand what this revival is about and why God is willing to trust us with powers He has not trusted any other generation before. Because no other generation will see this power, but also no other generation will be as selfless and sacrificial. That is the level He wants us to reach. We are really like Jesus on this earth. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you give us a true vision of the mystery of the cross and resurrection. Fill our eyes with a vision of the cross. Fill our hearts and minds with visions of the resurrection power. When Jesus gave himself for us, Cause us to see Jesus for who He is. To know Him. To be like Him in every way.